thank you, and good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Um, today, I have the very happy task, indeed, of introducing Ben Oakry, um, who will give the inaugural Free Word lecture. As you've heard, my name is Tim Duffy, and I was, until recently, chair of Free Word. And before I introduce Ben more formally, I thought I'd tell you a little bit about Free Word. Um, it was founded in 2008, um, to work at the intersection of freedom of expression and literature with the very firm belief that you can't have one without the other. Our building in London, the Free Word Centre, housed organisations including Index on Censorship, English Pen, The Reading Agency, The Book Trust, Arvon, Reporters Without Borders and Article 19. It, Free Word is an organisation that believes in collaboration. We spent 15 very happy years supporting and championing artists, writers, and activists, often marginalized and unheard voices. Freeword developed local, national, and international collaborations that explored what it was particularly interested in, which was the power and politics of words, delivering a very diverse and often experimental artistic program. And along the way, we've worked with well-known voices including people like Kamala Shamsi, Neil Mukherjee, Alif Shafak, and others. But perhaps more significantly, we've supported thousands of less well-known but equally important artists from diverse communities. So why are we here? Um, the sad bit of this story is that during COVID, Freeword lost the building on which it was dependent. But this is a story with a happy ending. So we took the decision as trustees to transfer the funds and assets of free word to another organization to continue the work. And in the Bradford Literature Festival, we found the perfect home. Inspirational leadership from Saima Aslam, imaginative programming, down to earth, and, and, and a very unstuffy approach. And to quote The Guardian, the Bradford, Bradford Literature Festival is hailed as one of the most, most diverse and inclusive festivals in the country. It's one of the jewels in this city's crown. And we could not be happier that Bradford Literature Festival is taking on the free word legacy. It's in safe and very exciting hands. And proof of that, where it be needed, is that Ben Oakery has agreed to give the inaugural free word lecture. Ben Oakery is a Nigerian writer, poet, and essayist. He's recalled that his earliest reading memory was being hustled out of the living room at four years old because he was reading his father's copy of The Times. <laughs> Over the holidays, um, he's recalled that he would visit the libraries of foreign embassies and read his way through their literature. He believed he would become a scientist, but with the publication of his first novel, Flowers and Shadows, he acknowledged, and I quote, the life I was meant to, li to live began. And what a life. He's, he's served as poetry editor for the West Africa magazine. He's published numerous books, including most recently the novel The Freedom Artist, short stories, including Prayer for the Living, poetry collections, including An African Elegy, prose poetry hybrids, the long poem Mental Flight, the essay collection A Way of Being Free, and of course, the Booker Prize winning novel The Famished Road. Ben's many honors include an OBE, numerous fiction awards, a collection of honorary doctorates, visiting professorships, and uh, he's a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature. I really am thrilled, on behalf of Free Word, Free Word thrilled and delighted to introduce Ben Oakry to give the inaugural Free Word Lecture. Thank you very much, Tim Duffy, for that wonderful introduction. Um, greetings, everybody. A real pleasure to be here and to have you here. And um, I want to, again, celebrate what everyone's been talking about, which is the great success and the visionary, <clears throat> the visionary aspect and qualities of the Bradford Literary Festival, uh, as well as uh, Saima Aslan and her great 
um, courage, vision, and thoughtfulness. Um, it's a real honor to give this inaugural lecture. Um, I shall be addressing some of my favorite subjects. Um, and freedom is right at the center. The proof of this is that I've written at least two books with freedom in the title. Uh, this is to celebrate um, Free Word Center's migration from London to the Bradford Literary Festival. There's a powerful relationship between freedom and creativity. And it is not what we think. Fundamentally, creativity doesn't need anything in order to be. Creativity is one of the essential laws of life. For life is intrinsically creative. One can almost say that this is what life is. All it does is create. You know something is alive because it is always creating the conditions of its own continued life. Whether it is rebuilding cells or destroying them, the force of life is always making, always doing. It is never static. Even when it is destroying, it is creating. For, at bottom, it is the same force at work. It is important that we get this principle straight in our heads. Life is always creating. We are always creating something. It might be a mess we're creating. It might be chaos. It might be even boredom. But creating is what the force of life is programmed to do. Creativity doesn't need freedom. It just needs existence. Plants will grow on cement. They will grow on rocks. I have seen trees grow from a stone wall. In Nigeria, I have seen a table sprout buds. I have seen weeds grow on metal. You can't keep the force of life down. It erupts even in the most toxic conditions. Creativity is the secret will of a living thing to perpetuate its inner vitality, its inner truth. Creativity is the I am that I am within all living things. Contrary to what we think, even death is part of the creative cycle. If you take the long perspective, the creation of anything requires the death of a previous condition. To create is to destroy, and often to destroy is to create. This has to be grasped right so that it doesn't become a mantra for murderers and sociopaths. Take a relationship. If a relationship has to get better, some aspect of it must change. Take a piece of writing. If it is to be improved, some sentences must be crossed out, some paragraphs ditched or altered. Sometimes our problem in life and art is that we want to create without destroying. Often, we want to destroy without creating something even better from that which was destroyed. Creativity only needs life. We have seen many cases where writers in prison have created works of astounding truth. Not even prison, exile, calumny, ostracism, can quell the irrepressible fact for a living spirit's need to perpetuate its most essential truths. There are some that have come to think that perhaps creativity is most powerful when conditions are worse, when artists are in prison, or when they are poor, or when they are neglected, or when they are oppressed. I know some writers who secretly miss the imprimatur to their creativity that apartheid gave them, and, how, and, now, now, and how now they are free, they don't quite have the same spiritual force, the same hunger. 
I partially sympathize with this view. So does Picasso. He said somewhere that artists are like those birds that sing sweeter when you put out their eyes. How very Spanish of him to say this. <laughs> but also how true. Too much freedom takes away focus from our spirit. If you can say everything, why say anything? If you can say what you want, how can you get around saying what you need to say? Sometimes it seems to me that writers need to find a cage that they can write their way out of, need to find a prison that they can escape. All of this is a way of, all of this is a prelude to saying that the cage is always there. The prison is always there. It is just that our societies have tricked us into thinking that it isn't and that we are free. Perhaps that is the greatest trick played on us, the trick of thinking that we are free. It is a vast mesmerism that has to be wisely and cunningly opposed. We are not as free as we think. We are in a simulacrum of freedom. There are new bills restricting our right to protest. It has become, for some people, more difficult to raise questions around decolonization, around statues of slave traders, around race, around appropriation. We live in a supposedly free society because certain subjects make people nervous. We're not supposed to raise questions around them. It turns out that our freedom is not so robust after all. Right now, the idea of freedom is that those who are comfortable in their dominant positions want to be able to be free to express their thoughts and their jokes. But when others question the status quo and question the settled assumptions of the world, suddenly the establishment wants to pass laws restricting some of those views. I read somewhere that a Tory MP in some kind of fantasy was seeking to pass a law that would make the mention of the negative aspects of empire illegal. This is the equivalent of being able to beat someone up and then to pass a law which stops them crying out. Historically, I guess, some people want to eat their cake and have it. Imagine Germany passing a law that says any mention of the concentration camps is illegal. Freedom has always been central to the human race. It could be said that the story of human civilization has been the story of our journey towards greater and greater freedom. Civilization itself is the evidence of how we become both free and more unfree. And the most important freedom of all is the freedom of thought, the freedom to express one's self, the freedom to be. Creativity needs nothing but life for it to express itself. But some things give greater wings to the creative spirit, and the greatest of them is freedom. Lands where unfreedom reigns may confer a tight and limited freedom to writers and artists who suffer incarceration, but when the greater freedom of a people is threatened or curtailed, the whole society suffers. Industry, innovation, science, business, all suffer. The culture shrivels. The spirit of the people perishes. Apart from life itself, freedom is the single greatest nourisher of the spirit of a people. Free word has championed freedom of speech for a long time. Along with Penn International and Amnesty, free word has worked hard to help writers and artists who suffer incarceration of or exile for expressing uncomfortable truths about their regimes. It has championed freedom of speech and freedom of thought in literature. Many people in Britain might not know it, but writers and artists around the world suffer great penalties for speaking up for their people, for defending their rights, 
for drawing attention to the unconstitutional things that their governments do to their citizens. In the Arab world, musicians who sing about the excesses of their regime find themselves with long prison sentences. In Eritrea, 22 writers and journalists have been in prison now for over 20 years, and no one has been allowed to see them, not even doctors. I've often said that where there is any repression on the freedom of speech or thought, something is going wrong in a land. The average citizen should take a keen interest in legislation passed that affects their freedom of expression. In this country, we've already lost one plank of a certain kind of protest, of a right to a certain kind of protest. I think that's the beginning of the erosion of some of our human rights. The right to protest, whether loudly or quietly, is a fundamental principle for a democracy. For democracy is not about manufacturing consent or even compelling consent. It is about the right of different voices that make up the nation to be heard. All of our voices must be heard. Our children's voices, the voices of women, of blacks, of Asians, of the LGBTQ communities, of the elderly, of the differently abled, of prisoners, should all be heard. Democracy is not about the uh, oppression of the, by the majority. Democracy is not about the majority. We have seen many kinds of genocide erupt from the perceived incontestable rights of the majority over the minority. Democracy is about every voice being heard and governing on the principle of doing what is best for everybody. It does not mean that if you win elections, for example, on the promise of beating people up who have less votes than you, that if you do win that election, that you should actually do it. The majority is not always right. Often governments must do things on the principle of fairness, of balance, of giving everyone a chance to grow and contribute, to prosper and feed their families. I personally think it is time we redefined and raised up the meaning and possibilities of democracy. We need to define that concept upwards. For democracy now is being used as an excuse to be as inhuman and as thoughtless as possible, if you can get away with it electorally, and if you have enough people to support those policies. That is why all struggles for freedom of expression and freedom of speech should be supported by the widest possible uh, sections of the community. This does not mean that freedom of speech should be used to spread hate speech. It does not mean that we should use it to demonize others, to destroy their confidence and peace of mind. It does not mean that it should be used to denigrate people and to shame them. Freedom, freedom of speech ought to come with great responsibilities. It ought to come with restraint and sensitivity. I read in the papers the other day that a comedian said that comics should be allowed to make jokes about anything. And I wondered if he would appreciate jokes being made about his dying mother, or his sick daughter, or a suicide in the family, or some differently abled relation. People say things sometimes without thinking. Surely there are areas of personal anguish and sensitivity that it would be best not to indulge one's freedom of speech. And while I'm on this subject, the idea that freedom of speech means freedom to give offense can only have been dreamt up by people used to giving offense rather than other than receiving it. But society is a constant battle of freedoms, a constant battle of mythologies, of political positions, of religious beliefs. We all have our freedoms, and the world is where they collide. But of the many freedoms that we intrinsically have, Perhaps the most important, publicly, is the freedom to challenge our governments about their policies, about the direction that they're taking the nation, about their use and abuse of power, about their treatment of citizens and minorities, about their dubious activities and cover-ups, and about issues of justice. This is one of the greatest public freedoms because without it, we cannot hold our governments and all powerful structures like corporations to account. Without it, the big forces in the world can get away with murder. 
with injustice. Without this freedom to question them, to challenge them, we would more or less be living in a tyranny. Some of the greatest protections of democracy, one of the greatest protections of democracy is freedom of speech. In some ways, the presence of this freedom speaks of the strength of the democracy. To the degree that this freedom is impinged on or eroded is the degree to which governments are quietly morphing into something frightening and strange. This is why we always speak about eternal vigilance, which is why the responsibility lies not just on writers, artists, and journalists of a land, but on every citizen. It is a citizen's responsibility to be aware of how their rights are being slowly eaten away. There is in Britain right now, as I speak, a city where you can no longer protest in its center. When they restrict the form of protest, in effect criminalizing it, then it must be admitted that we have entered a new era. We all need the right to protest. Who can be sure that they will never need to raise their, raise their voices about some unacceptable condition in their lives or the effect that some law or policy is having on them? <clears throat> if you are elderly, laws may be passed that restrict your pensions or your presence in society. If you are a student, laws may be passed requiring you to pay much higher tuition fees. If you are differently able, laws may be passed that restrict even further your freedom of movement. There is simply no telling when our governments around the world, in a fit of short-sightedness, chasing one, set of, one popular set of policies or vote-winning legislation, might now press forward bills that might have a terrible impact on our lives. And sometimes it is too far away from the next election to wait to register one's legitimate protest that way. Sometimes we just want to let the world become aware of our legitimate grievances now. Sometimes we just want to send a peaceful and urgent message to our leaders. Hence the importance of this right to protest I keep talking about. Without it, we're stifled and our grievances are stifled. And in addition to the deafness that comes with power is the suppression of what power most needs to hear. And the combination of these two factors make for bad governments. And when this happens, it is us, it's we, the people, who suffer. Freedom of speech is allied to freedom of thought and freedom of belief. This means that people are free to believe what they want, provided they don't try to impose those beliefs on, on others. But these freedoms are important in a multi-faith society such as ours, where people are allowed their faiths and spiritual beliefs, or their lack of belief. For a long time, one kind of faith was the norm, and Jews were barely tolerated, as can be seen in Shakespeare's The Merchant of Venice. Then Muslims were seen in a dubious light. Before this, the country nearly tore itself apart in a Catholic-Protestant schism. And after Henry VIII, Catholics became the persecuted. Faith ruled the nation for centuries, and now slowly atheism is gaining ground, and to some is acquiring the status of a quasi-religion. Atheists are now, being, are now beginning to be as intolerant to people of faith and spiritual inclinations, as they once suffer, suffered intolerance. Freedom of speech and thought means that we ought to have respect for the faith and the beliefs of others. Philosophically, this implies that there is something within us, in the human makeup, that is as sacred as life itself. And that something is the freedom to be. It took us hundreds of thousands of years to get to this realization of the importance of our freedom. It may be an intrinsic right, but it was one that had to be fought for, and it is one that still has to be fought for every day. Because the biggest threat against this freedom of expression is the very power structure itself that we have given the power over us. The biggest threats are our governments, our leaders, powerful corporations, and all the structures that have acquired power over the lives of individuals. And because of all of these, the individual each day begins to feel powerless. They begin to feel that 
they have no say over their lives and that they cannot contribute to the way that they are governed and express themselves about what their governments do. This silent disenfranchisement of citizens, which is a self-disenfranchisement, I can't stress that strongly enough, contributes to the sense that the powers that be have that. It contributes to the sense that the powers that be, I always had a problem with this sentence, <laughs> contributes to the sense that the powers that be have that whatever they're doing is right. I'm going to come back to that. <laughs> Often people just do not know how to express their confusion at how they're being led. By elections and general elections appear to be the only way of expressing our approval and disapproval. But by God, what a blunt, dispersed, and, and unspecific way this is of expressing our annoyance or hurt at one act of legislation or policy. It is one of the crucial reasons protest is so vital to, the, to a democracy and why freedom of thought is healthy for the strength of a culture. The trouble with dictatorships and autocracies is that they stifle the intellectual and cultural life of a people. They rob the citizenry of responsibility. They take from the people fire, intelligence, truth, authenticity. But more than all that is the way dictatorships crush dissent and are murderous to the slightest questioning of their policies. A government that cannot be questioned, cannot be held to account, that is not responsible and cannot be brought to justice is dangerous and an evil. A government that has power without checks can do anything. And as power tends to make people mad because it divorces them completely from reality, a dictatorship can begin to do and carry out the most destructive policies that would have a detrimental effect on peoples for decades or even centuries to come. We must be extremely careful about our governments acquiring to themselves too much power, about their making of laws that increasingly make it hard for them to be called to account. We must be careful about the preservation of our core rights. And it is important that we not only defend these rights here, but around the world. This is the work that Free Word has been contributing to, co contributing to for over a decade. In over 50 countries around the world, writers are imprisoned, tortured, driven into exile because of something they have written. Many important novels were banned in various states in America, in China, in the Middle East, in Turkey. Writers routinely have their works banned. There is a correlation between the banning of books and tyranny. Where books are banned, dangerous things are happening, visibly and invisibly, in the life of a people. Where writers are censored, something vital in the people is already being suppressed. I have said it before, writers are the barometer of what is happening to a people. And that is because writers consciously or unconsciously express what is going on in the depths of a people's spirit. They report the events taking place beneath the flesh of the land. And it is because they do this using language. The language that people use every day. And therefore, an intelligible language. The same language used for laws and legislations. It's because of this that writers are especially at risk. But then any individual using an intelligible language to express their freedom of expression and challenge the status quo is also at risk. I want to say for the hundredth time, this freedom must be protected because to protect this freedom is to protect the lifeblood of a culture. When freedom of expression dies, the culture becomes hollow. The people become shadows. This is the ideal of authoritarian regimes, but it is death to a people because they live in fear and they crouch under the rock of tyranny. Nothing good can come from such a people. No new inventions, no innovations in science or business or any of the great arts. 
There will be no true happiness as such among a people who cannot be themselves. It would not be much of a life. We cannot live fully without freedom. And freedom of expression is the laughter of a child in the playground of the spirit. The evolution of civilization is towards more freedom of spirit. It is towards more being. All of our highest creativity depends on our freedom. It is a testament to this fact that we manage to create important works when we are deprived of freedom. And that is because we find freedom deep in us where those who repress us do not expect us to find it. That is because we create from unfreedom in order to create the freedom that we lack. But our greatest creations were not created in prison or in shackles. Our greatest creations were made by men and women who breathed the air of the gods, the air of liberty that connects our flesh to our genius and our genius to the great surge of immortal energy that is at the back of all creation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that. Um, truly uplifting and inspiring as always. Thank you. It's such a great pleasure um, to be here and to have been here and to be able to um, launch this inaugural Free Word Lecture. When um, Free Word found its home at the Bradford Literature Festival, I knew that Ben was the natural choice uh, for this lecture, for the very first one. Um, not only because I'm obviously a massive fan, um, but because his words have always embodied freedom of expression. And I wanted to ask you, where does that impetus come from? As a child during the Civil War, we came back from England, went back to Nigeria, then the Civil War broke out, and the Civil War broke out in my family because my mother was half Igbo and my father was a southerner. And we had to flee Lagos, and we fled to dad's part of the country. And not long afterwards, uh, many Igbos who were part of the community mixed in, you know, because Nigeria was supposed to be like that. Many Igbos who were part of the community suddenly disappeared. And one morning, because I liked wandering as a child, one morning I went wandering and wandered near the river near where we lived and saw these things on the water that I'd not seen before. They were not canoes. They were not, they, they didn't make sense. They were just really weird things. And it took a while for it to crystallize and I saw that there were bodies, um, and there were bloating bodies. Um, and what had happened was that many, many, many young people, many Igbos were shot um, and dumped in the river. And that started a kind of a question in me about um, well, what it means. What, what, does it, what does it mean to be a human being? What does it mean to be part of a community, and then one day you can wake up and you can suddenly be the enemy? What does it mean when people can tell stories about a group of people and suddenly make them out to be horrible or monsters and make it easy for us to do things to them. Um, it just started all these questions really very early and I, I haven't stopped asking those questions. And I think that's really reflected in all of your work. Um, the, fir the first book of Ben's that I actually read was An African Elegy and um, it's actually a really special occasion because this year is actually the 30th anniversary of the publication. And um, I was so delighted um, to be able to uh, mark the Free Word Lecture with, with that anniversary as well. I, I came across... <laughs> look, look and of that. course it is available Lim afterwards. <laughs> Um, I came across it when I was at university, and I, I remember standing in the W. H. Smith and picking this book up and opening it and just, just skimming through it and being struck by just the absolute myriad of emotions that are captured in it because there is love and beauty and, and yet so much brutality. Yeah. And I, the, 
the, that formative experience, is that what is reflected in an African elegy? Yeah, it's reflected in all my works, um, because I, like I said, I began to ask these questions. You know? um, and I, was asked, I asked the questions locally about Nigeria, and then when I came to England, I found that the same questions were true. And when I, as I traveled around the world, I found that everywhere I went, people were making up stories about other people. People were perceiving people in strange ways. People had laws about other people. I, I began to think, what is, this, what, is this, what is this quality about the human mind that we find it necessary to demonize that which we don't understand, or people who are strangers amongst us? And then it led me to this thing of freedom. And poetry, poetry and freedom have a really, really strange in a relationship. Um, I'm almost tempted to say that poetry was born from freedom. Some will say that poetry was born from celebration, from ritual. But even the fact of ritual itself and the fact of celebration itself depends completely on freedom. You can't celebrate if you're not free. Um, so, so, so for me, poetry has this double bird, this double, um, double root. One part of it is in Celebration. The other part of it is in this freedom, this, this what it means to be human, what it means to look at the world um, and see it for what it is, um, and to express it in language. Would you say? <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Would you say, though, that poetry is also related to confinement and constraint? Yes, because you can't have poetry with uh, excessive freedom. Poetry itself needs the constraint of form. It's a very strange thing about it, that we, we enjoy poetry because here you are, the poet has this, this, this tornado, or this river of an experience that they want to express, but they can only do it within a certain number of syllables, certain, within a certain meter. Um, I think it was E.R. Br Brathwaite, who was quarreling with the Western idea of, of the pentameter. And he said something uh, very humorous and really thought-provoking. Um, he said, life doesn't speak in pentameters. Um, and you know, you know what he means, you know. Um, but then on the other hand, the pentameter itself, and most of those great poetic forms, actually came out of some kind of deep understanding that there's something musical about our response to life. Um, not just a heartbeat, but there's a, there's a kind of an inner music to, to, our, to our existence. There's an inner rhythm. Um, so, absolutely. What do you think? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm the one who's fangirling here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm fanboying too. <laughs> the great work you're doing. No, I... I um... I love your work, and I mean, I'm, I'm obviously a fan of poetry, but I, I love your work because of all those different emotions that you capture. And I've, um, I remember, you know, I'm also a fan of the poetry and reading about how, um, I think the nearest translation I can give is the, the force that it takes to turn the carbon into diamonds. And I've, I've always thought that poetry is like that. And I, I read your work and just the, um, universality of human experience that it captures, and this quest, this journey that is forever going on through those books, like Astonishing the Gods. I remember, I, I don't know if you have read Astonishing the Gods, but if you haven't, you are missing out, and you need to go and buy it and read it. <laughs> um, but I, I was so struck by that, that journey um, from start to finish, that self-realization, and that line about, you know, the the only person holding up the bridge is the person crossing it, which I've probably completely mangled. Where does all of that come from, that constant quest? Because it feels like you are never satisfied. No, it's not, it's not that I'm never satisfied. Um, it's that... Um, we're, I mean, those of us in this art, you know, we're dealing with a fundamental impossibility, you know, which is the impossibility of language to express the mystery of life. You know, um, the mystery of life is the mystery of life. It's the mystery of love, it's pain, it's, it's how we grow in spite of difficulties. It's all of this stuff. You know, it's our dreams, our sleep, our children, their growth, their surprising us. All of these incredible things. And, 
you know, and life is life. Life is, and then but words, words is not life. Words is something else. Words is an abstraction. Words are an abstraction. It's like, I keep using the example of tree, you know. Uh, you go out and you see a tree, you know what a tree is, but you write it on a page, it's T-R-E-E. -E. Um, but you know, and you look at this thing and look at this word and they don't quite correlate. Even, <laughs> even the word tree, the way it sort, of pe it sort of peters out, it begins very encouragingly with a T, <laughs> you know, which, which looks like a tree. Then it goes to R and you're like, okay, maybe branches. And then it goes to these two E's. And what is that? You know, and the tree, the tree doesn't do that. Okay, maybe the E's are the, are the, are the leaves. Um, maybe the E's are the relationship of the leaves to the trunk. And, but there's not a correlation between those two things. In ideographic languages, there's much more of a correlation, much more of a relationship between things and, and the language used to express them. And that's just one word I'm talking about. And then story, to tell a story. My goodness, what a bizarre thing that is. I mean, who dreamt of that? You know, we, 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 we acquired language somehow, and then one day someone decided to tell a story. Hey, guess what happened to me today? I saw this giant mastodon. A giant what? Mastodon. Really? Is that how you pronounce it? <laughs> you know? And then we tell, this, we tell stories. Um, and these stories somehow express us. But it's not us. It's an incredible mystery. It's an impossible mystery. You can feel it there in Shakespeare and Homer. They're trying to get words to wrap around life. And life escapes. But the great ones catch the tale of life here and a, you know, a, a, a coat tail there. And of course, you, you catch those tales beautifully. But who inspires you? I mean, you've just mentioned Shakespeare and Homer. But if you were to um, reference somebody that you read and, and who has really inspired you and whose work that you, when you read it, you think, I would love to express in this way. That's a dangerous desire. <laughs> <laughs> All desires are dangerous. Oh, it's a dangerous desire. Goodness. There's some people I really think, yeah, maybe I should just go home. <laughs> just go back to my bedroom and cover my head and do something else. Yeah. No, some, some, some writers have managed somehow to... It's not just the language they use. Sometimes it's just the, the way in which they tell a story. And some, I keep going back to Homer. I shouldn't, but I do. Um, and, you know, partly because I think Homer is not just Homer. Homer is the recipient of many tales and many wisdoms that have come from unknown places. Um, and what, all we have now is this thing, this construct that we call Homer. I first read the Odyssey when I was about five um, not the full Odyssey, I read, a, <laughs> I read a kid's version. Don't get too impressed too quickly. <laughs> My goodness, read Greek at four and a half. <laughs> you, 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 that would be too shocking, you say, Ben, you're lying. No, I first read a, a kid's version at, at four and a half, and I kept reading, reading successive versions and translations as I got older. Um, and the, the simplicity of the child's version that I read was, ne was not lost in the adult versions that I read much later on, the same greatness and strangeness of those stories um, remain um, and continue to haunt me. Um, you know, the idea, of this, the, the idea of this guy was trying to get back home. Um, it took him less than a year, less than a couple of months to get out to this battle, to this war. But it took him 14 years to get back home. Just the ratio between these two things uh, fascinates me. Why did it take him so bloody long to get home? <laughs> Surely it's the, strain, it's the same straight journey back. But there's this, all these incredible detours, and, uh, and the Greeks explain it by the machinations of the gods, the way he's detained here by uh, a goddess, by Calypso, the way he's lost there, the way he's... Those parts of the journey, those, those things fascinate me. They're, impossibility of homecoming. Um, even when he gets to his, back to his own land, 
He lands on the shores of his own land. Between that and actually getting to his home home, takes over about um, a sixth of the novel. The long, almost the longest part of the novel, the most substantial part, is the difficulty in his home of getting to his home. It's <laughs> really, really bizarre geometries. Um, it's things like that that fascinate me. So how, how inspired are you by mythology? Because I remember when I read um, some of my favorite poems by Benny's, And If You Should Leave Me, and the thing that I was really struck by, one of the lines is, for you reconnect me with all the myths in the air. So you're talking about loss, and you're talking about mythology. Is mythology one of your enduring inspirations? Yeah, I would say so. Yeah. I kind of fell in love with myth as a kid. And I don't know, it was like discovering the marrow of life. Um, and I, I used to read myths to go to sleep. Um, myths from everywhere. Um, the Sumerian legends, um, the, you know, epic of, the epic of Gilgamesh, um, Egyptian legends, African legends and myths, the story of Obatala, um, of Ogun, of these gods and of all these figures. I don't know, they, it's, like reading, it's like reading a kind of a story of us, but through a really weird mirror. Um, they just help me navigate life. Um, in a way. And as I got older, I came to realize that we may not be aware of myths, but myth is aware of us. You know, because we live our lives, whether we know it or not, we're weaving our lives between Mishila and Cheribidis. We're weaving our lives between all of these big mythic structures that are around us and are inside us. You know, we're living myths all the time. And I think we would, we would live it a lot better if we have a sense of these myths that brush against us, or that we brush against. Um, we should, you know, it's one of the first things I began teaching my, my daughter. I just kept giving her books of myths, and she completely loves them. She's, she's, she's a bit myth bonkers at the moment. <laughs> um, her favorite, her favorite, she, her favorite story is, uh, is um, do you, do you want to hear the favorite story of my daughter? So I just wandered off into a little, <laughs> into a little thing there. They don't want to hear about my daughter's favorite story. I, well, I think they definitely do. Yeah. <laughs> well, she's fascinated by the story of Cerse and how she, how Cerse supposedly turned uh, men into swine. And she used to ask. She keeps asking me, Daddy, what, what, how did she? Why did she? What did she? And what happened to? Um, and that's, that's a fascinating story. Um, she's also fascinated by, by horses that fly, um, by sacrifices. Why did they put that woman on the rock to save the whole town? <laughs> How did you answer that one? <laughs> ah, that was difficult. I said, well, they didn't really put the woman on the rock. It's just that sometimes we have to put something on the rock. She says, ah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, um, I'm conscious of time, and I thought um, it would be wonderful if you would perhaps, given, given this 30th anniversary, if you were to perhaps share a few words from the African elegy with us. Should I read a love story, political poem, uh, um, uh, a poem of um, mystery? What's your, what's, what's your, what's your taste this evening? What do you, I'm, I'm presenting a, little, a small poetic menu for you here. <laughs> you, can only choose, you, can only choose, you can only choose one item. Oh God, I got, I've, got to go, I've got to go through the whole volume to find that one. <laughs> I went to a restaurant once where they had this incredible menu, very elaborate. <laughs> they presented it to me, huge menu, all of these extraordinary things. The man stood there and he said, you can only choose one thing. <laughs> <laughs> and if you should leave me. 
And if you should leave me, I would say that the ghost of Cassandra has passed through my eyes. I would say that the stars in their malice merely light up the sky to stretch my torment, and that the waves crash on the shores to bring salt stings on my face. For you reconnect me with all the lights of the sky and the salt of the waves and the myths in the air. And with your passing, the evening will become too dark to dream in and the morning too bright. I think that deserves a round of applause. <laughs> And this is, um, this is one called um, Anyone Who Doesn't. Um, I think it's a poem of indecipherability. And anyone who doesn't tremble at the gates of reality will be broken by what they encounter in the city and its secret dungeons and its history which keeps rising. At the gate of each unnameable reality, it is possible to lose a fear and an illusion. It is possible to witness miracles in your life by surprising your destiny. And I should really read the title poem, if I can find it. Um, because it recently became um, uh, the poem that was, that's been kind of, it's been taught in, was chosen by South, South Africa as one of the poems that um, its students must learn at, at O levels. An African Elegy. We are the miracles that God made to taste the bitter fruits of time. We are precious, and one day our suffering will turn into the wonders of the earth. There are things that burn me now, which turn golden when I'm happy. Do you see the mystery of our pain, that we bear poverty and are able to sing and dream sweet things, and that we never curse the air when it is warm, or the fruit when it tastes so good, or the lights that bounce gently on the waters. We bless things even in our pain. We bless them in silence. That is why our music is so sweet. It makes the air remember. There are secret miracles at work that only time will bring forth. I too have heard the dead singing. And they tell me that this life is good. They tell me to live it gently, with fire, and always with hope. There is wonder here, and there is surprise in everything the unseen moves. The ocean is full of songs. The sky is not an enemy. Destiny is our friend. I don't really want the conversation to end, but sadly, time, our time has ended. Um, ben, thank you again for agreeing to deliver this inaugural lecture. Uh, Tim, thank you for interesting uh, the legacy and the flame of free word to the Bradford Literature Festival. Wow. And thank you to all of you for being here today. Um, ben will be outside. <laughs> we will have a book signing. Um, and I can't think of a better thing to take away from today and the Literature Festival as it's drawing to a close than the, the words of Ben Oakley. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you.